It's right up my street, it's my boulevard, it's right up my straza, oh my god, it's garden right up there, oh, it's right up my podcast. Ooh. Welcome to Right Up My Podcast. My name is Kate White. And my name is Gwen Watson. And this is the podcast in which we talk to people about the really totally awesome things that they do to make us feel good. And this episode, episode 18, we are going to be talking to a wonderful psychotherapist all about listening, about how to be a better, more effective listener, but also how to communicate in a way that makes you feel like you're being heard more. This has come about after me and Kate just basically spend hours talking at each other. Neither of us feel <laughs> like we're being heard at all. There's nothing I like more than when Gwen's halfway through a sentence to just butt in with my own <laughs> hilarious story. <laughs> that is me all the time in our interviews, just waiting to jump in with my interesting point so we've hello, resorted expert. thanks for sorry i just did it to you there. It's like, hello expert thanks for sharing with us your wonderful knowledge but i think you're fine i've got something fascinating to say right about let now. me tell you about my anecdote <laughs> you're gonna love it so we have called in a psychotherapist to help us with that issue um let's give her a name check before we go on oh yes charise cook I loved chatting to Sharice. I hope that you enjoy our chat that we, um, yeah, which is coming up. Um, so before we get on with it, it's a little bit of wiffle waffle, isn't it? And actually, you've got some loose ends from last episode to tie up, haven't you? Some I cliffhangers do. that I'm sure the listener has been <laughs> desperate to know. <laughs> <laughs> Absolute cliffhanger. Last week, you were talking about stuffing your face before coming on air um, or before coming on to record um, with the... We couldn't remember the name of them or where they were yeah. from. The basically, you meant the loft, the lotus biscuits, didn't you? Oh, yes, I did. Lotus and biscuits. They're oh, the ones that you dip in your coffee. Oh, caramelised biscuits, which are from Belgium. Get in my belly. They're so good. So good. And, so and if good. a sponsor, if Lotus, if Lotus are listening and want to send me a lifetime supply of Lotus biscuit spread, I'll DM you with my address. <laughs> Let the magic happen. Um, <laughs> hey, on the subject of food, I'm going to be a little bit more obsessed with food than usual um, coming up because oh, yeah. I'm going on a little bit of a detox. Good on you. Yeah. Tell me, how is this going to look, this detox? Well, um, let's just say I've been dipping some peppers into uh, Tara Masalada while waiting oh. for you to join the Zoom. This is quite a leap from lotus biscuit spread yes. to peppers and tarantula are good. Well done. Yes, and it's great. So what I'm basically, I'm doing a bit of a gradual. I'm I'm cutting down my booze to just two nights yeah. a week. All I'm right. going to basically cut out sugar. So I do eat quite a lot of dark chocolate. I have quite a lot of honey in my tea. I'm going to cut out the chocolate and just cut down the other stuff. Okay. And um, tr try to avoid sugary snacks. Um, I don't want to be the friend that kind of deters you from your tract. But dark chocolate, some people say that's quite good for you. It is quite good for you. And I think if you can do what the uh, experts recommend, which is a couple of blocks with your cup of tea in the evening, then okay, I'm sure that's you. really good. Not all through the day. I do right. a couple of blocks yeah. with my cup of tea in the morning, after lunch <laughs> and after dinner and maybe a couple more blocks. So anyway, basically, I'm finally, finally going on a health kick and I'm, I've, I've joined up with a friend. We're going to go and see a personal trainer on Thursday and right. um, I'm going to start walking with my friend Matt up a hill every Tuesday morning and I'm just yes. going to very gradually get healthy and fit again because I don't fit into any of my wardrobe I feel a bit rubbish but mainly my energy levels are really shot and I'm having to nap a yeah. lot and I just know I keep hearing that if you cut out the sugars and you just mm. you know put in more kind of slow release good good foods then yeah hopefully I'll get some hopefully I'll get some energy back and feel tickety boo well good luck to you love thank you I'm very excited um I just wanted to mention though I mentioned earlier something that's possibly a little bit divisive yeah. to our listeners I, did, I was trying to gauge the look on your face when I mentioned I was eating <laughs> tara masalata well, I felt like I'd taken a flashback to a 1990 dinner party. <laughs> do they still make taramis salata? Yes, they do. And it is well, well, absolutely well. delicious. 
Is it still a strange shade of pink? Yes, it is. Do you know, I went to Athens recently with friends, but over there oh. it's much more white. I realised that the oh. pink versions that we get in plastic tubs in our supermarkets <laughs> may have been a little bit tweaked over the, de- over the okay. years. <laughs> They've decided that the consumer needs this dip to be pink in colour. It's fish eggs, right? I mean... It's That's yeah, it's supposed to be cod row, from. isn't it? Or it's it's mm. some kind of row. Mmm, fish eggs mm. all mushed up. Stop it with your seductive <laughs> cod row chat. So tell me, are you a yay or an A for the Taramasalata dip? So it has to be the right thing dipped in it. A carrot stick in taramasalata, bring it on. Ooh, I could eat that yeah. all day. Um a bread stick in taramasalata, no, doesn't do it for me. So what? it's got it's the combo of dip and crudiment. Good crudiment? Lord. Or is condiment? I get my words confused. <laughs> crudite. 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 That's what I, mean. hey. I just made up a new word. <laughs> <laughs> um, does this extend to other dips? Like, are you the same with hummus that you only enjoy it with a certain yeah. thing dipped in it? Yes. So hummus has to be with something fresh, like some pepper or some cucumber. The creamy dips, like your sour cream and chives, that can be with some crisps or some potato sticks. It's all very complicated. Oh but in my, my mind, God. makes a lot of sense. I feel very strongly about it. Well, I don't do know. Do you just if dip I... anything in anything? I think I do just dip anything in anything. And now I am I the heathen here? Have I been fucking this up all along? Are people listening going, you don't dip peppers in taramasalata? That's for hummus. What's wrong with you? <laughs> That's but crazy I've, talk. <laughs> yeah. It's no, I dipped a sausage roll in that earlier. I mean, yeah, I'm working towards you the what? detox. Yeah, <laughs> honestly, everything goes in taramasalata. But this is, this is, abs- this has absolutely blown my mind. Yeah, I don't know if it's a texture thing or if it's just the sort of the, yeah, to do with the level of creaminess. Yeah, I'd never really thought about that being a strange until I'm now articulating it out loud. And I'm aware how <laughs> weird that might be to but, people okay. listening. Do you go to other people's houses or to um, weddings, no, bar and funerals <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and, and look at the choice of dips and chips and think to yourself, oh, no. Or do other people know this rule and always put out the right combo? This is the first time I've ever shared this this inner ruling of mine. And yeah, I do. I go to someone's house and if they've got a put of hummus and a bowl of crisps, I'll be sitting there thinking, there is nothing that's going to make me dip those crisps in that hummus. Wow. And the rest of you are being quietly judged as you do it. <laughs> <laughs> For any of my friends listening, I don't really, I promise. <laughs> yes, she does. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Good for you, Kate. That's how you, wow. that's how you stay so slim. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's my secret. <laughs> So if you want to join me in giving up some sugar and booze, you're more than welcome. Yeah, I might think about the sugar thing. Not ready for the booze yet, but I might think about the sugar thing. <laughs> That's quite the pause there. <laughs> um, right, what have you been watching or reading, Dull? I'm halfway through a book called American Dirt, which is incredible. It's been out for a while and it's about a family and the impact of the cartel in Mexico <gasps> on their life and I cannot put it down. Is this it's, where she's trying to escape the cartel? It is and she's oh, trying to head amazing. north. Have you read it? Yeah. It's incredible, isn't it? Yeah. There was some controversy because she's not Mexican but what an insight. Yeah. Yeah. Because basically it's the a, a, an experience of a family trying to escape cartels in Mexico and make their way to America and all yeah. the other people they meet along the way <laughs> who are on the same journey and the treachery that's involved in that journey because yeah. there's obviously people going to ex- trying to exploit them at every at every yeah. turn, at, at every junction. And um, yeah, and just that this is a real lived experience for so many people every day, not that's only it. in America, but obviously here coming across Europe, like it's... Yeah, that's it. And regardless of what you think of the author writing about that subject matter, the fact is it's a subject matter that is based on experiences of real people. And Yeah, and I actually think it's really important for us to know this. It is, because it's very easy to get blasé and it's very easy to feel like there's a big gap between you and them, but, you know. Yeah, yeah, us and them, yeah. And when the beekeeper of Aleppo is a similar on a similar vein. Really? Because he's, um, he's escaping from Syria to come over to the UK. Right. And that, I mean, I, I haven't stopped thinking about it. I read it about a year ago yeah. and it's, it's often, often pops into my really? mind, the experience of, yeah, the yeah. experience of families having to, gosh, just awful, awful, yeah. the journeys that they have to, te- have to make and the risks they have to take. And then the wor- welcome they get when they get here. Yeah. <sighs> 
Um, anyway, that went down a uh, <laughs> unexpected political... Hey, something to cheer you up. <laughs> <laughs> um, if you would like cheering up and you are on Instagram, obviously follow us at Right Up My, but also... Um, somebody that I've started following recently and it seems that it's just he's just spreading like wildfire amongst all of my friends largely because I'm sharing him <laughs> with everybody but we, he is spreading joy throughout the internet his name is Francis Bourgeois I'm pretty sure I have um, pronounced that wrong um, and he is a train spotter and he loves nothing more than to go and see trains. And um, here is one of his reels that I shared with you recently, Kate. I haven't seen my good friend Gordon for many months, but very soon he'll be passing through this junction here with so many tones. I cannot wait. <laughs> <laughs> We're up to 60 tones. <laughs> Thank you, Gordon. Thank you so much, Gordon. I'm going to run over. I just love the unbridled joy that it brings him. Oh, my God. So, so utterly joyful that everybody, you cannot help but be lifted and joyed and he can really, um, we need more. He is, it is the purest joy and we need more of him, we basically. Do. And I love that reminder that you can just get that giddy joy from the simplest things in life. You know, you don't have to spend a lot of money on a, b a fancy holiday <laughs> or you don't have to like go to see a professional comedian. You can get joy from so many things. Well, I don't know if I would get as much joy as Francis from True, looking at the train, but we're living <laughs> vicariously through him. And I tell you what, I will put his we will put his link in the show notes so you can follow him because he is amazing. I love it. Ah, it's right up my podcast. All right. So this is episode 18, which is all about listening and being heard. And we are talking to Sharice Cook. So Sharice is a psychotherapist and she specialises in relationships, working with both individuals and couples, but not just in the romantic sense. Any significant relationship, basically, in all areas of our lives, from partners to colleagues to families and children. And we wanted to talk with her about listening and how integral that is to any healthy relationship. But not just how to be better at listening, but also how to communicate better in a way that makes you feel like you're actually being heard. So we started our conversation with Sharice by asking her, what makes a good listener? I think a good listener is someone who's prepared to listen. That sounds really kind of basic, but when we are having a difficult conversation, especially, or we're talking about stuff that's maybe particularly sensitive, because that acts, you know, that does something to the brain in us where we're suddenly like, I'm a little bit in danger here. There's kind of a threat. You know, we're so vulnerable in our relationships all the time. So we're going in and out of these quite primitive ways of relating. And we will go into fight, flight, freeze without even, you know, we'll do it in a nanosecond and not even realize it's happening. So I think, you know, there's something about recognizing within ourselves, am I able to listen right now? Or am I more interested in defending or responding? Because mm. those are not the same as listening. As a listener, like you might be somebody who listens, asks a lot of questions, invites that person to open up, follows through the theme, <laughs> yes. or follows through with their story. Mm -hmm. But what you get in return is them going, oh, you're feeling sad. Yeah, I've been feeling sad too. Mm. Or yeah. you've got a bad back. I had a bad back once. That's and you it. feel immediately... Yeah shut off and I'm really just thinking like what what are those different listening types is there a right way to listen like am I right in thinking those people are not good listeners I think it's probably a little bit of both I mean a lot of therapy whether I'm working with an individual or a couple we will do work around uh, listening mm -hmm. and we will do work about around empathy because mm -hmm. that is really important mm. when we are in relationship with people and we claim to care about people let alone love people um, it's amazing how we can't empathize with them or we can't see their perspective or we can be quite dismissive and defensive that's 
sadly the way a lot mm. of us are so so doing that work i think is is really important but there is definitely something about um appreciating the difference and sort of it's, it's like you know it's a little bit of a contradiction there are a lot of paradoxes it's like yes let's work on how we communicate and how we listen and how we deal with each other and let's really understand that different people do it differently and how we interpret someone's behavior matters right so you know so in your in the example that you've just given you know here you are maybe feeling oh just wanting to talk and share and whatever and because you're so patient and nice and ask questions and are really good and curious and all the all of that good stuff which is great but you don't get that back that could be perceived to be hurtful because you you probably want what you give which mm, is to be interested yeah. and to be really empathic and all of that so yeah it would be great for that other person to develop the skill of being able to communicate in a way that's meaningful to you so you feel heard you know i think that's an important thing when it comes to listening yeah the the thing about am i a good listener is does the other person feel heard by me yeah exactly you know, that's a really really key thing and a lot of us will say well I don't you know this is a common thing in therapy I don't feel heard you're not hearing me you're not hearing what I'm mm. saying you know all of that kind of stuff so I think it is about a balance between understanding it's 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 not a malicious thing coming back at us sometimes you know people are just doing the way they do things and it would be great for them to develop but it would also be great for us to be able to um, take into account that people do it differently and this person might be listening to us but they're just not responding the way we want that's interesting so it's there's not one size fits all as far as mm. being a listener like would you say that there's kind of rules to being a good listener definitely definitely i think we could all work on our listening and i think there are in relationships especially when relation you know we've been in relationships for a while i mean if you think about the beginning of relationships all we do is hang on each other's words you know we're yeah. just so interested <laughs> and they're the most fascinating people and we love them and we can recall things they say verbatim you know <laughs> Fast forward a couple of years, five years, Yo. ten years. It's like, what did you? Were you even speaking? <laughs> I didn't know you were going to Greece for the weekend. Yeah. When did you tell me that? Uh, yeah, <laughs> exactly. So it's sort of um, there is definitely something that we can we can work on. But what I will say to my clients is that listening kind of starts before right. something's even being said, and that goes back to you know this idea of. Am I able to listen right now? Because mm. I think, you know, when we're dealing with couples who have been together for a while and inevitably there's conflict and irritation and, you know, all the stuff that's just part of life, um, the, the listening part of the brain just shuts down. We're not really interested in listening. We're, you know, we're far more invested in maybe complaining or, you know, wanting to be heard ourselves or whatever. So... For me, a big thing about listening is kind of getting yourself into the right frame of mind for listening. And so I do very kind of um, unsexy and romantic things like yeah. plan a difficult conversation mm. or plan a sensitive conversation. You know, plan it, put it, put a time, put it in the diary if you need to and go to that okay. with your head on, you know, ready to listen. What happens a lot in all of our relationships is we stumble upon a subject and then mm. emotions escalate and then there's just this tennis ball match of kind of defensiveness and anger and everything else and nothing yeah. constructive is going to happen there mm. so that's so all therapists will just say okay look that's not useful take a time out come back to this conversation when you're ready to listen and then people kind of get that they kind of go okay i recognize i'm not really ready to listen and i'll say in my consulting room couples will start having some argy bargy and then I'll be like okay hang on and I'll say are you able to hear what your partner has to say now or no is it is it too and then the people go no I'm not interested in listening mm. and you know people are very honest about it so I think recognizing that is useful so mm. it's interesting because we're talking about listening here um, in terms of having an important conversation with someone close to you and but what mm. about some people are terrible at listening even in just the the chat at the pub you know, even in you're aware that that person yeah. that you're sat at the table having a glass of wine with, you can see that their mind is somewhere else. And even if you're talking about something really superficial, mm. even that can be quite um, difficult to be on the receiving end of, even if it's it's not 
a conversation of any weight or importance. That's very true. And I think, you know, years ago, and it's probably changed since, since, since then, but I remember there was research with the advent of social media and, you know, everything else has kind of gone on, that our attention span, I think, went from something like 12.3 seconds and it literally dropped in a few years to nine seconds, <laughs> which is right. a significant, significant drop. So we are, in a way, incredibly short attention span at the best of times these days. Mm. And it's kind of condoned and it's kind of okay. And so there is something about the skill of focusing and concentrating and hearing someone else is definitely difficult. And for some people um, who can be very in their heads, so they're sort of overthinkers or intellectualizers or whatever, it's very hard to be present in the moment of kind of listening. Right. And so mm. um, there's definitely something about, you know, like I'm saying, part of building your ability to be a better listener, but also build awareness around that is ironically it's doing something called emotional regulation which is just trying to keep ourselves a little bit more grounded and a little bit calmer because there's something about you know what the, the situation that you're describing that you're at the pub or you're at the restaurant and there's lots kind of happening we're in our own heads we're distractible we're not grounded we're not calm we're not in our bodies yeah. you know we're in our heads and we have between 50,000 to 80,000 thoughts a day wow. I'm pretty sure mm. I don't but <laughs> 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 well, anyway, but it's kind of so, so there's stuff going on in our heads all of the time. And we are so in our heads and kind of worrying and thinking about something else or getting distracted. And so moving out of our heads into our bodies and just can't, you know, being more emotionally regulated, being more emotionally in touch with ourselves allows us to tune in more with people. And so that's why couples therapists will do breathing exercises with um, couples and individuals feel your feet on the ground are you okay okay can you feel your body because we just get so sort of um worked up but we also can just get so distracted that we're sort of these flighty people and we're not able to really be where we are and concentrate on any conversations that are happening even fun superficial ones yeah. yes and and people really do have a habit of just taking turns to talk or you can tell mm. that people are waiting to jump in and um, and you can tell that they're not going to jump in with a you know a question to ask you more about the story you're telling, but they want to jump in with their own example. Mm. And I'm sure actually we all do it, don't mm. we? So it's like, what is what is that about? I think for certain people, the the ability to identify someone else's story is 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 a form of connecting for them. Is a form of trying to say, oh, I get it. Yes, that happened. And we can sort of obviously receive that, as you say, of hijacking what we were trying to talk about and kind of emotionally taking it kind of somewhere else. So what I would love to say about that is, is be ruthless with bringing it back to yourself. Because I think yes. it's very, um, we then can get into a place where we're just sort of angry the whole time or kind of resentful is sort of to be able to bring it back because the person that we're dealing with probably would be able to handle that very, very well. It isn't that kind of thing like, oh, they're just taking over. And even if someone does take over, it's like, well, you just take over yeah. right back. Because, mm. you know, there's this great um, phrase, which is match the behavior. Ooh. Yeah, it's a, it's a really great thing. So when you're dealing with whatever you're dealing with, something's kind of whatever. And, you know, we then continue on in our own way, which is great, being sweet and kind and curious and whatever, or, you know, furious underneath, but we'll never show it or kind of whatever. But if someone is, you know, if someone's interrupting, if someone's bringing it back to themselves, if someone's kind of, you know, talking about themselves the whole time, it's like match the behavior, you know, it's kind of st step into that. You know, I think we can step back into our upset and sort of feel wounded by that. And, that, and that's OK. But I'd rather do something different and kind of step in and be like, OK, I can see what's on offer with this person. This is how I need to communicate with this person because they're not really going to be super sensitive to me and my questioning and umming and eyeing And oh, that's interesting. It's like, OK, I need to be a bit more assertive here myself. Um, so I've got a better understanding of how we can act differently in a situation. Now, is it at all possible to um, make people better listeners? Like, hmm. like, because because I've I've got a friend who is really keen for for me to be more open with her. Okay. But my experience of her is when I st start to talk and start to open up, is that within about twenty seven seconds she will be telling me how I must be feeling, 
which really stops me in my stride. Mm. Like, in that situation, I mean, it's a very difficult thing to bring up, isn't it? How mm. do we, how can we alter those? I mean, it is it is difficult, and especially when people are well-meaning. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah, really well-meaning. It's well really meaning. difficult. Mm. Yeah, but then, but but for me, that's an open door. You know, a closed door are family members who just want to tell you what to do mm. and kind of, you know, maybe kind of quite dominating or kind of whatever. You know, in, in the situation that, that, that you describe, you've probably got someone who really wants to know how to support you better and is supporting you in the best way they know how. But um, so I think, I think in that situation, if the door is open, I would suggest to, to manage our own vulnerability in those conversations. Because opening up isn't the same as kind of falling apart. And if you if you know you have a friend who is a bit of a fixer or is going to talk over you or kind of explain your own feelings back to you or kind of whatever, you know, that's that that's difficult. So you can have conversations about, look, what's really helpful for me is if you just listen or sometimes when you say boom, 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 that just shuts me down, actually, and I really want to be open with you and if you think that that's open for the person, I think that that's great. But I think there's also something about looking after ourselves in these situations. I'm having to keep myself quiet and still while you talk, even though I'm excited. Yes, I'm a buzzing and thrilled about that little thing that you said. I couldn't be more delighted. I wanted to ask you about silence in mm. conversations and as part of a kind of huge experience of interacting with someone else. And what made me first think about this was that um, someone in my life <laughs> is um, they're very, very mindful of making sure that you've finished what you wanted to say before they start talking. Oh, wow. They really mm. don't want to talk over you or butt into you. So they'll always leave a bit of a pause at the end of mm. when you finish speaking just to make sure you've said everything you need to say. Well, that's my interpretation of why they do it. Maybe they're not even aware that they're doing mm. it. And that that silence <laughs> is excruciating <laughs> for me. And it comes up in other interactions with other people for other reasons, I guess. But I have I'm the same as you, <laughs> Kate. I'm the same as you. Yeah, me too. Me too. I yeah. have this knee jerk desire, this need to fill it with inane chatter. Yeah. So what's that all about? <laughs> it is funny because there's something so respectful about that that's almost weird in this world of ours now. And especially in, you know, perhaps what you are more familiar with and what most of us are familiar with, which is just very um sort of collaborative conversations, shall we say, where people are jumping in and interrupting and kind of finishing yeah. each other's sentences or correcting or, or, or whatever. That that has become very, very normalized. But, um, you know, what's, what's always interesting is to be thinking about what does this person's behavior tell me about them? You know, and it's kind of, yeah. why does this person do that? And what, what does he, the, him or her doing that, what does that say? about maybe what's important to them. And so it's kind of, there will be something, as you say, it could just be nothing, it could just be the way the person is or whatever, but there probably is something about this person is a mindful person, a person who's very kind of interested in respect or um, sort of also perhaps what they say has a, has a lot of meaning where the rest of us can just be talking out loud, thinking out loud as we talk and, oh, I've just had this idea. You know, maybe maybe this person when, you know, speech is something that deserves a degree of um, attention and respect. Does that does that sound mm. like this person that you're talking about? Yeah, very much so. Very much a person that when they say, speak, they've got something to say. Right. And so and obviously probably very patient with um, you or anyone else who might be a little bit more <laughs> uh, happy to chat. I mean, I would say my suggestion, if I may give you one, would be to really um, embrace Please. that and take that as a little bit of a, of a challenge. Because there is also this thing and... Um, you know, it isn't a, you know, I don't think it's about biology, but I do see this, see this in a lot of women, although I do have had men like this as well. And there's this great um, acronym or whatever, which is WAIT. 
It stands for Why Am I Talking? <laughs> <laughs> Which is a really good one because it's like, what am I saying? Why, why am I talking? What am I saying? Because sometimes when I'm with clients, I'll be talking and I'll interrupt and just be like, where are we at? Where are we going with this? What are you trying to say? And the person will literally be like, I literally have no idea. You know, and we're just like these runaway <laughs> trains, right? And we can just go, go and go and go. And I think there is something, perhaps this could be an opportunity for you to just sort of sit with the discomfort that it brings up in you and be like, okay, maybe I can just sort of take a few breaths and think about, you know, being really present and what am I trying to say and say it in a way that I can do with this person. Because it's different to my other person who I can be like, la, 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 and we can have a great big fun, like vibrant conversation. It's going to be different with that other person. Because it's also quite revealing for us, obviously, therapists speaking here. You know, therapists will go, oh, that's interesting. Why is that? You know, why is it uncomfortable to be silent? And, you know, and often mm. we can really go back and silence can feel... Yeah really quite scary for us you know if we've had a silent parent or you know perhaps you know at school we don't know what to say so we went silent you know there can be a lot of associations around silence and so we actually do have this investment to be talking and filling silence and taking responsibility for silence when it happens etc cetera, etc cetera. so yes the the fact that it's uncomfortable is just interesting and you can reflect on that i think yourself and um yeah, and you know, and maybe you can encourage him, you know, it's like with yes, always the balance. Yes. It's like you can encourage him to be more more spontaneous and more kind of free with perhaps, you know, him him chatting to you, just invite him to do that. And you can also, you know, try to think about yourself being really mindful and intentional about what you're saying, um, to match his behaviour. That's good advice. Silence can be really powerful, can't it? There have been other occasions yes. in my life when I have managed to stop talking. Shock, horror, everybody. There was some power in that silence. Mm. Not, I don't mm. mean that in an egotistical way, but it, it, you realise that a lot can happen yeah. in the silence. Definitely, definitely. And a lot of um, like communication experts and sort of um, speaking experts will encourage us to wait a, a couple of beats before responding and because someone might say something additional or we can just gather our thoughts or whatever. I mean, it's interesting because as a therapist, I have to be comfortable with silence. Yeah. Mm. It, it has been something I've had to learn. It's like, do, do not fill the silence. It's like, what well, you know, the, something important might come out here or let's just wait and see if there's sort of something else. And so silence, it is an interesting thing. And actually my therapist said to me recently to do exactly that mm. to pause because I had a bit of a, a an, an awakening in realizing that you know so I do ask a lot of questions and I want to, I really do actively want the person mm. to be heard and listened to and even when sometimes I barely know that I'm talking about their next door neighbor's uncle or right. something and I in, yeah. I in my mind I'm going why am I talking about this like yeah. <laughs> I have moments of that but um and I was telling a friend about this because uh, I'd been on a date and I ended up speaking to this guy. I was asking him, he'd been on the Camino Trail. I was asking him about it for about 40 <laughs> minutes until, <laughs> and I was like, honestly, yeah, our conversation was really like 70, 30, 70% mm. mm. him talking and only 30% me. And, um, and she said afterwards, she said, you know, in our, in, she said, that's what happened in when we, we got together because you asked yeah. me a lot of questions. And she was like, how about you just, pause <laughs> give him a chance to speak yeah. Yeah. and I was like ha huh. <laughs> and I was telling my therapist this and she was like yeah how about you don't try and fill the gaps <laughs> with asking another question and just just wait mm. just shut up you are very good at it though, Gwen you're always whenever I'm web talking you do always mm. genuinely come across as being really interested and yeah you are you make the other person feel like oh god i mean my, my life has interest this is good <laughs> and, and you you, most of the time genuinely i am really interested <laughs> but yes sometimes i do end up going but yes but why isn't this person asking me about me that's it so that's a classic case of you probably giving what you would also like mm. but we can sabotage ourselves by dominating the conversation being so wonderful and inquisitive and everything else <laughs> And that is kind of how, you know, absolutely. There's a, I think there's a danger, especially in a dating situation and in a, and a, and a, in a romantic situation. As women, I think more and more we are leading and Ooh. we need to learn to lead less. And, you know, unless we're totally happy with that, 
But I think for a lot of women, there's a sense of, I want this and I, I want to be getting this. And it's like, okay, well, sit down <laughs> and let that happen. You know, it's kind of in our anxiety or whatever, sometimes we can sort of lead, lead, lead and then get, you know, annoyed that we're leading. So it's, that could be, yes. perhaps be a challenge. I'm kind of like, hmm, what if I let someone else lead the conversation here for a little bit? And, you know, and let's see what happens because then you get some valuable information that could sort of help help out in that dating dichotomy. <laughs> yeah, interesting. And do you know what? I went to an event recently and I recognised this like anxiety that I have because I wasn't feeling, I was feeling like I needed to be entertaining or I needed mm. to be chatty. And, and, and then I had a moment where I was like, this isn't my event, this isn't about me. I think yeah. it was somebody else's birthday. And I was like, this is, this is their event, let's let it be about them. I don't mm. need to, I don't need Amazing. to do anything in this situation. Yeah. And so it allowed me to just kind of just be quiet and just be there. And that was like, ha. Huh. That's yeah. fantastic. And then when you do say something, it's really kind of from the heart or spontaneous or kind of really deep, whatever. Really yeah. important. Yes. And yeah. I was like, <gasps> Gwen spoke the whole that. room stops in, in, in awe of what you've just said. Yeah. <laughs> That's exactly what happened. Yeah. Right. Okay. <laughs> I like to live in a predictable way I have the same old sandwich every day The same routine, the same ideas The same tomatoes and the same cheddar cheese Oh, I'm willing to try something new With a nickel, pick a pickle and some chapter need to I'll give it a try, yes, I'll give it a go I might just like it, well, you just never know But I always love a cup of tea Now, as per usual, we always like to try these things ourselves. So we asked Cherise for her top five tips on being a better listener and also on how to get heard. To be a better listener, I think um, it, there's definitely something, you know, step number one is be aware of empathy. And I just describe empathy as um, accepting, not necessarily agreeing, but accepting someone else has a different perspective. Sure or just a perspective, you know, we all are going to have a, a perspective that's probably going to be slightly differing to our own. So definitely empathy. The second thing is be aware of when you are able to listen and when you are not. There are times when we are genuinely receptive to what someone is saying to us, even if it's difficult, and there are times we are not. It's really okay to recognize when we're not, but make some sort of time or some kind of commitment to come back to a conversation when you are receptive. Otherwise, that's going to be a dismissive process. The third one is um, start accepting that cooperation does not mean defeat. Mm. You know, when when we're listening, it's it can quickly become a, a competition and it can go, we can go into the black and white thinking of right and wrong and good and bad. It's kind of, that's not helpful in our relationships and when we're trying to listen to each other. So by cooperating and listening and putting down our sort of, you know, weapons and defenses and just listening, we can cooperate with someone just by listening to them. That's all we actually have to do. And that leads me on to the fourth thing, which is what the vast majority of people want in this world is they want validation. So by listening to someone, we don't have to agree with what they're saying. We don't even have to condone what they're saying. We don't even have to like what they're saying, but by simply being able to breathe through our desire to be reactive mm. and to just sort of genuinely hear when we feel able, we are validating that person. And we all know when we're trying to have a conversation with someone when that's not happening because we feel invalidated. And then the fifth thing is like, leading on from that which is recognize when we're being dismissive so we can be invalidating and dismissive oftentimes not really even because we want to or that we're trying to be but by by defending ourselves and by correcting people or insisting where they're wrong that is in fact dismissive and then that can create a lot of 
struggles in relationships because going back to the second point we then feel invalidated and then we feel unheard and being dismissive is not a winning strategy so shall we say so those are my five suggestions on like really thinking about okay how can i be a better listener genuinely that's really brilliant yes yeah. okay so then my five suggestions for how to help people listen to you more in situations is like i said is match the behavior mm -hmm. so whatever they are contributing or their style of of communicating pay attention to that and if you can emulate that to a degree adapt what you have to say and attempt to sort of communicate it in a way that they are familiar with and that is more likely therefore for them to hear it the second thing is to have like a like a word like a safe word which which symbolizes you're not hearing me or you're not letting me speak or whatever so you sort of agree ahead of time and say to someone listen i really want to say something to you sometimes we get a get you know things get heated or i feel like you're not sort of super listening to me is it okay if i say this thing and then that can just remind you i just want you to be listening to me that means not responding not giving me advice not trying to fix me or whatever the word in my family is um einstein hmm. um which i then get confused about and say frankenstein or whatever but you know yeah. that's sort of something that you can just say where it's just like einstein and then people can be like oh okay Mm. just zip it and then just try to listen so that may or may not work for some people the third one is share what being heard feels like for you so that is you just listening and not not saying anything really helps me to feel heard or um, you nodding and agreeing and making noises while I speak helps me to feel heard and then leads me on to the fourth one which is share what it is that you can feel when you feel or what feels like you're not being heard which is so when you're looking at your phone it doesn't feel like you're hearing me when you interrupt me it feels like you're not really listening etc and then the fourth one is i and this goes back to um and that all of all of the points which is try to stay really committed to what you want to say but do it in a way that is emotionally regulated and safe. So if someone's not hearing you, if someone is just correcting you or fixing you and you kind of say, look, I don't like it when you interrupt, would you mind just listening to me? This is really hard for me to speak, etc." cetera, blah, blah, blah. You, you really try to communicate that. There really is the bro what we call the broken record technique. Mm. And so you can just distill like one thing that you want to say and you just say it repeatedly. And, and I actually really, really like using this because it cuts through a lot of the noise and the why am I talking to the, you know, what am I trying to say? And, you know, what we might be trying to say is I've, I'm feeling really scared in our relationship or, you know, I'm, I'm scared something's happening. And you just say that over and over again. So someone's like, well, what's going, you know, but that, but that isn't what happened. And you go, but I feel like you don't care. But da, 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 da. I feel like you don't care. Da, da, da. I feel like you don't care. Da, 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 da. I know you could say that, but I feel like you don't care. And you just broken record it. And this works very well with um, children and adolescents as well, actually. You just say it over and over again. And even the most kind of whatever person will eventually be like, hmm. They'll, they'll talk themselves out of whatever to just stay. And, and, and for us to try not to get too upset about it, we just stay as emotionally regulated as we can. And we just say it over and over and over again you can say it with humor you can say it with fierceness you can say it with calm whatever is appropriate but you just do broken record and then that can also sort of wake everyone up to oh wow i wasn't really listening mm. you know you're not saying you don't listen to me or you don't care to just say i feel like you don't care or i feel like i'm i i'm always making dinner around here or you know whatever it is it doesn't have to be these big sort of statements but it's something that we're just saying very very simply perfect Thank you so much. Thank you so much to Cherise for taking the time to have that really interesting conversation with us and for giving us those really helpful tips at the end. And if you want to find out more about Cherise, you can go to her website, which is ShariseCook.com. 
And she's also got a really great Instagram account with um, lots of fascinating content on there as well. And she's on Instagram as at the Sharice Cook. And also she does an online therapy service, which you can join up to. So check that out on her website as well. Thank you, Sharice. That was a really fascinating interview, wasn't it, Kate? What did you think? It really was. And there were so many things that she said that I thought, oh, gosh, yes, that that's really resonates with me. But there were a few that mm-hmm. particularly stood out that I felt I could really benefit from trying to adopt into my life a little bit. One of the main things was this WAIT, the acronym yes. which stands for Why Am I Talking? Because, <laughs> as I said in the interview... I have a bad habit of sometimes filling a silence with just chatter. I mean, sometimes the chatter is justified because I'm enthusiastic or I'm excited or it's just the vibe of the conversation. But sometimes all I'm trying to do is fill a gap because I can't bear this gap while someone else is or isn't speaking. And I felt a lot better. Sorry, there's me just jumping in on you. But I felt a lot better when she, because we both said that we both do that, that she does that as well. It is actually really natural thing and it could come from you know bad experiences of silences or whatever that we just yeah. can't physically let a silence just be no exactly we've got to feel it. even when you know sometimes you're acutely aware of what you're doing it's not like a, oh I didn't realize I did that it's like I know that I'm just wittering into this silence mm. and I can see you glazing over so I <laughs> tried to think about that quite a lot actually in my conversations and in my interactions and do you know what I found that it felt like a real release, taking the pressure off myself. Ooh. Like I don't have to be the one to fill this silence or actually it doesn't matter if the silence there because some people are quite comfortable with that, aren't they? And that mm. actually to not put that pressure on myself to keep the conversation going every single second of the minutes that we're together, to take that pressure off my shoulders and just be like, okay, well, we'll just, you know, we'll have a natural silence and maybe you will fill the silence. Maybe you will come up that makes it sound a bit passive aggressive I don't mean it like that at all I just mean it no no but that's exactly what yes you're giving the other person the opportunity yeah completely and in a pace that maybe is suitable for them and it just felt like a real pressure like weight off my shoulders that's like oh I don't have to and if for example around the house with my husband it's like if we're not talking that doesn't mean there's a problem (laughs) if we're you know if there's a silence that's okay I don't have to fill it it's not it's not a negative <laughs> thing. So, Cherise, on behalf of Chris, I'd like to say thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I've just got this image of you following Chris around the house. Go, what are you doing? What are you doing now? Chris, Chris, are you all right? Chris, what are you thinking? Or tell him about my day. And then I did this and then I did that and then I said this. <laughs> like a small child. I'm painting a bad picture of myself. <laughs> <laughs> Has Chris now in the last week been going, are you all right, Kate? Yeah, I'm really worried she, about Kate. <laughs> God, she's a bit quiet. I don't know what's wrong with her. <laughs> so how has it felt then in conversation? How's it worked? Have other people then filled the silence themselves? Probably more than I thought they would. Probably there wasn't the need for me to dive in and fill those gaps because actually mm. they were kind of going to talk if I just give them another 20 seconds. And also, I mean, obviously we're talking about it like it was a very extreme type of behaviour. So it wasn't really, but it's, I imagine the people that I'm conversing with probably haven't even noticed a difference. It's just the pressure off my shoulders to feel responsible for the conversation and responsible for it to be sparkling and flowing. And actually... Which of course it is when you're involved. Well, exactly. (laughs) But it doesn't, (laughs) that doesn't have to be solely down to me to make that happen. That's quite a release. Oh, good. What about you? What I mean, there are other things that she said that really um, got my attention, I thought about as well. But what about you? Let's have a little talk about you first. Um, well, I think one of the things that I realised, because I was sort of, my angle was like, oh, God, I find other people so bad at listening and I am so great at asking loads of questions. And I kind of, you know... I kind of realised I'm not I'm not a perfect listener <laughs> at all. <laughs> and often I'm asking questions for the same reason as you. Like I'm trying to fill a gap or I'm trying to move the conversation along. Or sometimes I don't like the attention being on me. Sure, so I yeah. will flip it around. And I notice myself doing that when I'm feeling under the spotlight. And um, so that's something for me to look at. And also that we have different... 
we're not always going to be really receptive to listening. And at yeah. different times of the day or at different moods or at different days of the week, we can respond better. And yeah, definitely sometimes I, I can feel that I, yeah, I don't have the attention span. Mm. And I will then, I will totally butt in with my own version of events or story yeah. or a squirrel I've just seen outside. So <laughs> Something shiny. Yeah, so it's making me a little bit more mindful about that. And um, and I also practice with one of my friends, one of my friends who I is one of my friends who I feel doesn't ask me a lot of questions or doesn't, yeah. you know, when I bring up something, she doesn't really elaborate. Yeah. She's not asking me to elaborate. And I thought I would just do what she said, which is just, um, I would just talk and yeah. I will match her because she would just talk. And so I found myself kind of just just kind of talking about what I wanted to talk about. And if I wanted to develop or elaborate on a point, I would just elaborate on the point more. And yeah. that led to us talking about it. Yeah. And I realised how many times I've done exactly what she said, which is sit there stewing because I'm not being asked questions about yes. stuff because that's how I am in conversation. Yeah. Just because they don't do it the same way. Yeah. Um, doesn't mean that they're not interested or not they're not listening I have a responsibility to then offer that information and to be more proactive in it so yeah I tried that with a friend and it went really well I was gonna say how did you find that experience did it feel did you feel uncomfortable being so sort of proactive and pushing yourself forward like that well, actually, with this friend, no, I didn't. It was easy and it flowed and it felt good and not forced. I have got an, another friend that I had a go at doing this with, but it was we were back to the old habits. So I feel like I need to... Um, the old habits of her basically <laughs> coming back in and dominating the conversation. Right. So I feel like I'm going to... But I'm going to use some of her other tips and tricks for that, which is, you know... You tell the person what works for you and what helps you feel heard. Yes. And um, and I'm hoping that through that we'll get to some sort of a breakthrough where we have better communication and I'm able to be more open. Or, like she said, I will just know that she's not the person I go to when I need to be open and vulnerable. And that's yeah. maybe OK. And maybe that's OK, yeah, because I guess we don't have to be open and vulnerable with in every single relationship some friendships will mm. just be for the fun times or some friendships mm. will just be for talking about this particular subject and actually you as long as you've got those those core few that when the shit hits the fan you can go to that's that's probably okay isn't it yeah maybe that's okay yeah and and i think we all just try a little bit more to be better at listening yeah. and empathizing and and I and what she said you know people need everybody she speaks to in her psychotherapy context that they need to feel validated and yeah. and, th and you can validate somebody by hearing by hearing and listening and being more active in your listening yeah or pause and then silence hit them with silence <laughs> just ah silence. the pain the excruciating pain <laughs> for listening to Write Up My Podcast. We love hearing from you, so you can email us at writeupmypodcast at gmail.com and you can find us on Instagram and Twitter at writeupmy. Please like and subscribe us wherever you follow us and if you could pop over to Apple and give us a review, we would love that and we would love it even more if you could share us with your friends because your friends are awesome and we'd like to be friends with them too. <laughs> <laughs> and while you're at it, head to our Patreon page at patreon.com slash write on my podcast, where you can find all sorts of extra bits of content for your enjoyment. And as always, thank you to our fabulous team, without whom we could not do this. Uh, Pammy Muir, thank you for bringing your editing skills to our podcast once again. And Andrew Grimes on the music. He is hilarious. He is bonkers. He is brilliant. We love you very much. And Erica Francis George on the design. She makes us look great. Thank you, you guys. And we'll be back in a couple of weeks with our next episode where we're going to be talking all about failure and how to turn that into a strength. But in the meantime, keep trying things to make you feel good. Tell me, did you like the podcast, Brian? No! Oh. You've all
fun like Brian you thought our podcast was really great then don't hold back like subscribe and tell your mate but if like Brian you thought our podcast wasn't fun then just keep quiet don't feel the need to tell anyone We'd love to hear from you if you've got some thoughts to share Such rich and lovely views that all should be aware of But I hope you liked our podcast and you thought it was really great And if you did, like, subscribe and tell your mate Cause we don't need grumpy pants bringing everybody down No, we don't need negative Nellies making people frown No So I hope you liked our podcast and you thought it was really great And if you did, like, subscribe and tell your mate